first off, um, welcome and thanks a lot for having me. Thanks, Marjan, and the rest of the team to make up this wonderful um, event. Um, my talk is about um, automotive cyber security verification. Um, what I didn't mention in the title is I will be mainly talking about black box verification, um, which means that you want to assess the security without knowing much about the system beforehand. Um, I will come to that in a minute, why that is, this is important from our point of view. Um, first off, to myself, well, again, Marchand has already introduced me just a little bit um, to AVL. Um, we are an automotive um, service uh, and product company independent. So we are providing engineering services and also um, instrumentation and test systems to the automotive industry. And we have also cybersecurity teams, which in both of those divisions, um, the services and uh, the projects are active. Um, this is um, pretty much different, of course, um, because um, in the services branch, we are consulting people, helping um, building more secure systems. And in the, let's say, product division, we are mainly focusing on automating cybersecurity testing, which is um, the main topic I will be talking about today. So um, I already talked about that I will be talking mainly about black box testing. So why so? Um, well, imagine you're an OEM. Why would I know everything about the system? So why would I even bother to test and pretend I don't know? First off, um, it's in the relevant cybersecurity standard, which might be um, known to the most of you, and certainly if you're in the automotive industry. Um, and while well, um, I'll lose a couple of words in uh, about that in one or two minutes. Um, secondly, um, you want to have an attacker's view. You want to see what an attacker sees. Um, you don't want to, as we say, swim in your own sauce too much. Because um, if you imagine how such a uh, security uh, accompanying security process works is that you first off will probably do um, some sort of security analysis, a terror threat analysis and, and risk assessment. And from those threats you identify to your system, which you model um, in the engineering process, um, you then um, get out your, of your requirements. For instance, um, one threat could be um, that it would be not so beneficial if um, some communications could be read. I mean, for some occasions it could be, well, um, no, no concern at all. Um, for other uh, occasions it could be quite vital. That's um, the um communications is kept confidential and so confidentiality for some communications could be a requirement and this security requirement is actually you will test later on in the verification part um, and the problem with this process is of course if you don't identify it beforehand in your analysis then you won't test it later on and of course a hacker won't care about your terror and to actually gets to find those vulnerabilities a hacker would find without knowing anything of your internals. And this is what you also uh, want to be guarded against. Therefore, it's vital to do um, tests, um, well, basically blindfold. Um, also, another point is, as Nasa said before, um, we have pretty long supply chains. So imagine you're an OEM and want to just integrate an infotainment system. Mainly those infotainment systems are bought by tier one vendors. And um, depending on your contract, mostly you won't have a glue what's running on the system. Maybe it's an Android, maybe it's a QNX, maybe it's something else. I mean, of course, uh, the operating system you will know, but uh, mostly you won't get the source code. So um, the only things you have is your specifications you gave to your tiers and those are mainly um, interfaces and desired behaviors but of course you want to test it uh, without having the internals of the system and the other way around 
if you don't want to test yourself, which um, from the culture is not a good idea, as we know, um, you want to give your system to an external party. Maybe you don't want to give in all the details and therefore they have to test this in a black box fashion. So therefore black box testing is important. And according to the title, um, I will talk about um, well how it has been done, how it is done and how it will be done in future of course. Um, disclaimer past is a little bit of a staging here um, because um, these well sort of process is still valid and I don't think it will be invalid um, in future. Um, but first off, I mean a time ago um, there was pretty much no um, awareness for cybersecurity in the automotive industry at all. So let's say five, six, seven years ago, nobody really cared about security. Um, this was um, analogous to uh, the production industry, only um, that the production industry um, was a few years ahead. Um, actually, before joining AVL, I was in a research organization and were dealing mostly with um, traditional IT security. And I was astonished when getting in touch with production and energy people that they are a bit behind technically um, with their operational technology networks. And to be quite honest, um, the automotive industry is pretty conservative. So they are even further behind. So those discussions about security awareness, we have in the automotive in industry since let's say three years um, that it's really rolling. Um, and um, before that, it, it was not, wasn't much of a concern. Um, it only became really known um, in the year, I think it was 2015 with this infamous cheap Cherokee hack. So um, some guys um, just found a flaw in the cheap Cherokee. Um, and um, well, this flaw allowed them to basically take control about the car, uh, over the car. However, only when having physical access and they got too cheap and they were pretty much um, yawning and saying, well, if you have physical access, we have other problems. So they invested a bit more of research, precisely one more year and a lot of funding from, I think, DARPA. Um, but then they found an access uh, from the outside to the point of that vulnerability, and they were able to control the whole car um, remotely from the other side of the US. So um, then suddenly it became a concern, and this was um, a bit of a key moment uh, for the rest of the automotive industry as well. Um, also, as Marjan said, she liked videos. Maybe um, you want to watch this video, um, this pictures from this is um, from the Key Labs Tencent in, in China. Um, they are occasionally hack Teslas. And in this video, it's quite funny. Um, they are controlling a Tesla with a, a PlayStation gamepad. And this is basically how security research has been done so far. Um, a bunch of experts um, are going um, towards a system, invest a lot of time, uh, have to have a lot of knowledge beforehand, um, buy maybe old hardware and so on. And this um, process is, um, well, unfortunately, of course, very costly and very time intense. So this is not what you want to have in an industrialized fashion of security testing, um, especially not when right now, um, all, also referring to NASA's um, presentation, um, the regulation of the UNICE number 155 is becoming effective. So it's becoming effective for new types um, by this year and for all new um, admissions um, in two years, and then uh, you won't sell any car in EU, Japan or Korea. Um, and I think other countries, as uh, I think Australia as well, and, and some 
other countries. And no OEM uh, can really afford to, well, basically get rid of those markets. So therefore, you really have to adhere to the NISI regulation that demands a cybersecurity management system, which is um, pretty much um, a proper process of cybersecurity engineering, accompanying um, the development process of your car. And also, um, more or less in parallel, the ISO um, and the SAE, um, well, got out a norm, um, 21.434, um, which is basically defining such a cybersecurity management system for automotive systems. And um, there, everything like the Terra and how you um, built in your safeguards is defined. And it also mandates um, verification and validation. However, it doesn't, isn't really specific on how to do that. And also the UNIS is not. So um, a bit of the problem is now um, what um, do I actually have to present to an auditor for certification? or to the admission bodies to, um, well, document that uh, I've done my homework in cybersecurity. Um, to specify this and give a bit of guidelines to the OEMs, um, the ISO has two, um, well, um, projects for standardization ongoing, 8475 and 77, which are defining the cybersecurity assurance levels. So basically um, for what's our purpose, I have to um, fulfill what level of security and uh, the validation and verification procedures. Um, but all of this hints that we will do a lot more of testing, um, including black box testing, of course. And this means that we have to test way faster than, um, than we have done right now. And to do this, of course, we need new testing tools that automating parts of the process um, in order to be quick enough and to be structured and also reproducible enough. Because um, as you can imagine, manual testing, as I just said before, is heavily depending on the people that are testing basically. And I, I, I don't think um, this will vanish. So hiring the suicide squad of um, automotive security and letting it loose to your system on the test uh, won't die out because um, there are many, many things you just cannot automate. Um, so manual testing and well, classical penetration testing by hackers will still be around, but um, we need supplementaries and um, simpler um, industrialized little tests um, for baseline security to let those cars out of the road, out on the road, sorry. So um, one thing um, you want to do actually with your software is check it for uh, vulnerabilities, of course, automatically. And um, the first thing, the first obvious thing is of course to test it for known vulnerabilities. You have those databases um, of known flaws of software product, and you want to check if your system is susceptible to such um, attacks. On the other hand, of course, um, you want to check if your um, software has a flaw or, or better, not only a flaw, but really a vulnerability in it that may be exploitable. Um, that's not known so far. So there are systems that can do this black box as well. So um, taking the code, um, the binary code um, of the software running on your system and doing some pattern checking on it. Like, um, is there a possibility for um, buffer overflows in there and stuff like that? So this not necessarily ha have to be known uh, known vulnerabilities, um, but uh, rather it could be just um, basic flaws um, in the software that um, normally leads to an exploitable vulnerability. Um, within AVL, um, we using such systems um, and also in our product we sell, of course, um, and combining this with our, um, well, uh, software variant uh, managing system in order to provide a more or less holistic um, overview 
Um, so that's um, if those dozens of um, tier suppliers and the software you get from them are integrated into one big platform, you get an overview um, how it is um, with your overall system security. So this is pretty important, I think. And also, again, uh, it's important not to just check on the things you think of, but um, use uh, an external and, um, well, uh, at best automated system to be quick enough. What do we also do to actually test those um, vulnerabilities if they are exploitable? Um, we try to transfer um, attacks we know that work from one system to another. So if we have a sys an attack that works on one system, we in principle um, pull out anything that's specific to the systems because it's a problem, of course, in the automotive industry as um, everything's so proprietary. Um, and the parts of the attack we have so far, um, let me just change my pointer, um, is something like that, like that. We have a test case on one system that we know that runs. Um, and those uh, steps um, towards the goal, let's call it the kill chain. So what we are doing is basically um, ripping it of any uh, SUT specific information, like for instance, um, a test for a master and the specifics um, when they are taken out, we store it um, as a so-called scenario. So the scenario is done not um, attack the specific infotainment system and get to the canvas, but just um, try to exploit the infotainment system in a generic way, just a generic description, um, and get access to the in-vehicle network. And those patterns in the task case generation are then augmented again um, with the actual system on the test, because of course we need this information to really attack a system. And this of course is embedded in a process um, as described in the ISO um, standard. So to give you an example how this could work, if you're an OEM, you have um, the scenario of attacking a system, um, via the Bluetooth interface um, of your entertainment system and send something nasty on the canvas. So our scenario um, just says, um, basically exploits the Bluetooth interface. As you can see here, um, written in our own um, language, um, see if there is an exploitable interface um, and exploit it. Um, in the test case generation, then there is a really executable script out of it. And then when getting hold of the system, um, try to send something nasty on the canvas, which is translated to an actual can message in the test case generation. So um, this is what we call, um, well, concretization um, from the generic attack to a really ex executable attack on the system on the test. In future, this won't suffer. It. Um, therefore, um, we want to um, include behavioral models in the testing because um, we would have to know a lot about the system on the test to actually do this, what I've just told you before. And therefore, we are experimenting and do this in um, cooperation with MDU um, and um, learn a model of the system using automata learning. There are techniques for this. And the good thing about this, you can um, basically change that in a checkable form, which is basically a, um, well, huge um, logical equation. And this you can check for certain properties. For instance, um, you have some variable in that equation alpha, which means you're authenticated, and some variable beta, which means um, you have access to a certain resource. And it's obvious that um, alpha has to be true, that beta is allowed to be true. Um, if you have hundreds of those variables, that's not so easily. The good thing is that computers are pretty good at checking this stuff and exploring those paths. And maybe within the gazillion possibilities in the model, you find one um, that has alpha false and beta true, which means you have access to a resource you are not allowed to because you're not authenticated. And out of this very um, condition and state, we can generate a test case out of it. So we have a couple of projects, uh, some of which um, also Melodon is uh, involved. Um, 
of course, um, I'd like to take your question, but I don't think we have time. So if you want to um, talk more about this stuff, our product and uh, research, um, just contact me. My contact details are at the bottom. Thanks a lot.